نحمد و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل عقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیر من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم ارن الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارن الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ Today we will start our discussion with verse 83 of Surah Al-Baqarah وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِخْسَانًا وَذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسَنًا وَأَقِيمُوا السَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّقَاةَ سُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْقُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِزُونَ Allah says, And recall when we took the covenant from the children of Israel, enjoining upon them, do not worship Allah, and to parents do good, and to relatives, orphans, and the needy, and speak to people good words, and establish prayer, and give zakah. Then you turned away, except a few of you, And you were refusing. In the starting of the verse, Allah says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِثَاقَ Mithaq in Arabic, the root word is وَاو ثَاقَوْف And in Arabic it means a pledge, a promise, a pact which has been strengthened. So Mithaq means what? It means a strong pledge and it means a strong covenant and Allah says what is akhadna mithaqa bani isra'ila so what we need to understand that who took the covenant Allah with whom was the covenant taken with the people of bani israel when how was it taken and then what were the words of the covenant and what was it all about now to uh understand all this i would want to briefly repeat the history of the people of bani israel which we have already token uh, talked about in the verses previous verses of surah al-baqarah we remember that people of bani israel by the will of allah and by the mercy of allah they were freed from the oppression, from the tortures, from the persecution, from the tyranny of their tyrant rulers of Egypt. They, they just came out of it unscathed and without any problem and issue, they just walked through the river and in front of them, very, very much in front of their eyes, by the order and will of Allah, the all the army of the Egyptian rulers, they were drowned. And this was as a punishment for them from Allah. But this was a source of contentment of all the revenge which, which was in their hearts, in the hearts of the people of Bani Israel. And then by the mercy and rahmah of Allah, they were settled in the desert and they were given and provided with the shades of the cloud and the man and the salwa, the ready-made prepared foods from heaven. And then all the 12 fountains and the springs came out providing water for them. But now after freedom, after blessing them with freedom and after giving them all, showering them with all these blessings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expected what? Expected that they would be the obedient followers, supporters and helpers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. 
and it was now after freedom and after having a free piece of land for themselves they were obviously e expected to implement the sharia of hazrat musa alaihi salam so for this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called hazrat musa alaihi salam uh, first for a lesser days and then the days the duration of the days was increased for a 40 day meeting with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the mount of tur and there on the mount of tur allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave hazrat musa his commandments these are known as the 10 commandments of musa these were the basic foundational orders from Allah to Bani Israel. And when we will go uh, through these 10 commandments, we will realize that these are almost the same, same orders and the teachings as given in Quran to all the followers of Prophet Wasallam also. Because we know that the religion, the teachings of Islam from Hazrat Adam salam to Prophet Wasallam, the seal of prophets, has always been the same. So these 10 commandments which were given to Musa alayhi salam, they were given in a written form and they were engraved on stone slates. And the reason being that Allah knew the temperament of the people of Bani Israel. So they were given in this form. Why? Because number one, so that they could see it with their eyes and they could touch, touch them with their hands. This all made it easy for them to believe and to have and develop a stronger faith. And moreover, it was also given to them, engraved these all these ten commandments and orders of Allah. They were given to them and handed over to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, engraved on uh, the on the slates, because so that they could not erase them. They could not alter the writings on the stone slates as they later did. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purposely did all that. Allah Alim and Hakim then gave them these commandments. Now, after being given these 10 commandments, they received them and they received these commandments in such a miracle form. They still refused to accept. Allah took a solemn pledge from them that they would uh, completely obey the orders and uh, we've talked about it previously that the mount of Tur was tilted on them as if it's going to fall on them and they're going to be crushed under the mountain and then under this this uh, insecurity and fear they uh, they accepted the commandments of Allah and they, took, they made the commandment but then again they broke it soon after and they started disobeying so now in this verse we will be talking about the 10 commandments which were given to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and these I will also repeat are also the basic teachings of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the first point of this is what? La ta'buduna illallah Worship none but Allah So the first commandment was about the faith on the oneness of Allah because the first and the foremost right on all the bondsmen is is whose is Allah's the first right on all the bondsmen is of the creator of the sustainer so the most important right of on all the bondsmen is of Allah's and the most important right of Allah is to believe in his oneness and to refrain from associating partners in any form of polytheism. This is the same as we learned in Surah Tul Fatiha when we make a covenant and promise with Allah, This is exactly obeying La Ta'buduna illallah that we will not worship anybody other than Allah. And this covenant and this order means what? That the worship, worshippers will worship and the bondsmen will worship and obey only and only Allah and none but, none but Allah. The obedience and worship will be only of Allah and will be only for Allah. 
the purpose of obedience and worship of Allah will not be to get any worldly riches or gains or advantages, but just to please Allah and to save ourselves from the displeasure and the wrath and the punishment and the hellfire of Allah. So this is the first commandment and it is exactly similarly mentioned in Surah An-Nisa also where Allah says, Allah says, إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء ومن يشرك بالله فقد افترى إثما عظيما Indeed, there is absolutely no doubt that Allah does not forgive what association with him but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah has certainly fabricated a tremendous sin. In verse 48 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah is talking about and mentioning a major sin which he will not forgive. That is an unpardonable sin is being mentioned. And then moreover Allah has also talked about it as it being a, a huge fabrication with Allah. And then Allah has also labeled it as Ithman Azwima, a tremendous, a major sin. So three things now I repeat, a sin which will not be forgiven, an unpardonable sin, something which is fabricating over Allah and then a tremendous or a major sin. What is this? Is to associate or find partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Polytheism is what Allah is talking about in this verse. We all know that on the day of the judgment for a person's salvation two basic things would be needed number one right faith or belief and the second be righteous conduct or righteous deeds so now the right faith or the belief we know it comprises of five parts are five sections of faith, are five pillars of faith, and by some scholars they are also considered as six. These five are Iman Billah, meaning faith or belief in Allah. Then the second being belief in the day of judgment, that is Iman Bil Akhira, Iman in the day of judgment or the day of resurrection. Then Iman Bil Malaika, faith or belief on the angels and their beings. Iman Bil Qutub, belief or faith on the holy scriptures or the holy books which were revealed to the messengers of Allah. Iman Bil Rusul, that is belief or faith in the prophets or the messengers of Allah. And the sixth, by some scholars is considered as faith or belief in destiny or fate that is it being good or bad so these are the five things for which a muslim has to have faith or believe in when he enters islam or when he embraces islam prophet sallam said that faith has more than 70 branches the best among these is to declare that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. And we have to be very clear about the fact that any distortion in this faith, in this faith or belief of Allah will not avail 
even if one's good deeds extend to the vastness of the heavens and the earth. As Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, verse 91, Allah says, Inna lazina kafaru wa matu wa hum kuffarun falain yukbalu falain yukbala min ahadihim millu al-arzi zahabun la viftada bihi ulaika lahum athabun alimun wa ma lahum min nasirin as to those who reject faith and they die rejecting, never would be accepted from any such as much gold as the earth contains, though they should offer it for ransom. For such is a grievous punishment and they will find no helpers. So what is this? Allah is mentioning the punishment for those who reject faith or reject belief. And the first and the most important belief is belief in Allah. And as far as the belief in Allah is concerned, the primary and the foremost belief in Allah is the belief in oneness of Allah, monotheism or tawhid. This is the first pillar of Islam. This is the basic foundation of Islam. Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Buniya al-Islam ala hamsin shahadatan an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulullah وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةَ وَإِيتَاءِ الزَّقَاةَ وَالْحَجِّ وَالسَّوْمِ رَمَضَانِ The foundation or the pillars of Islam are on five things. Number one, witnessing, declaring, announcing, shahada, that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant, is the slave, and the messenger of Allah, offering salah and paying zakat and performing hajj and fasting in the month of Ramadan. So these are the four pillars of Islam and the first and the basic and the foremost pillar of Islam is to witness the oneness of Allah. So this monotheism, this tawheed, this belief in oneness of Allah is what without which Islam, faith or belief will not be perfected or completed. As Allah says, this will lead to all, all good deeds being wasted. Surah Al-An'am, verse number 88, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ أَشْرَكُوا وَلَوْ أَشْرَكُوا لَحَبِتَ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ If they are to join partners with Allah, all that they did, that is all the good deeds they did would be in vain for them. Everything will go down the drain. Everything will be wasted and there will be no rewards of the good deeds, however great they may be, if the person has done what? Law ashraku. Joining partners with Allah and committing polytheism will waste all the good deeds. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that is why Allah orders. Allah orders so frequently in Quran. Worship Allah and find no partners with Allah. Surah Zumar, verse number 65, Allah orders. Do not call any other partners with Allah or you will be amongst those who will be punished. You will be among those who will be punished. This is Surah Shura, verse number 213. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in Surah Maida, verse number 72, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ there is absolutely no doubt. My yushrik billah, whoever finds partners with Allah, whoever commits polytheism, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ 
there it is sure shot it is definite that allah will forbid with him the gardens of paradise wa ma'wa hunnar and fire will be his abode and this is exactly what we are reading today the verse number 48 let's repeat it again inna allah la yaghfiru allah will not forgive ay yushrik bihi that anybody finds partners with him wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha verse number 116 in surah nisa allah repeats the same thing that allah will not forgive joining or finding partners with him but he will forgive whom he pleases other sins than this so that is why prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam condemned polytheism and ordered to stay steadfast on monotheism the words of the hadith are la tushrik billahi shay'a don't join partners with allah la tushrik billahi shay'a wa in qutilta aw harqta do not find partners with allah even though you may be slain or you may be put in fire so this is the importance of understanding the concept of monotheism and negating all forms of polytheism a person who believes and has faith committed faith on the oneness of allah will be released from hell fire and he will be made to enter the paradise and will also receive the benefits of the intercession of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there's so many ahadith to explain all this concept hazrat anas radhiyallahu ta'ala and who narrates in musnad ahmad that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever dies mamata whoever dies in a condition that he testifies with heart felt conviction that there is no god but allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of allah he will enter paradise so this is a promise of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam similarly hazrat anas radhiyallahu ta'ala and who reports in muslim that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was riding and hazrat muaz bin jabal was riding behind him and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called him o muaz and he replied la bai rasulullah wa sahdaika prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i'm obedient and i'm i'm here prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again called him o muaz and he repeated with the same words when he was again called o muaz and he again repeated with the same words and then getting his attention prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the person who affirms that there is no god but allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the servant and the messenger of allah allah will forbid hell for him and another another hadith narrated by hazrat usman radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in muslim prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says whoever dies in a condition that he considered certain that there is no one worthy of worship but allah will enter paradise so this is the promise for monotheism hazrat anas radhiyallahu ta'ala and who narrates in tirmizi how prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has promised the bondsmen of allah forgiveness of all sins if they stick to the faith of oneness of allah prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah almighty declares o son of adam while you keep on calling me and you have hope in my forgiveness i shall forgive every sin you have committed o son of adam if you come to me with your sins that are about the size of the earth and meet me in a state that you have never made anyone as my partner i shall forgive all these sins that are even about the size of the earth allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutawakkirin rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana dhunubana wa qina azaban nar hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said on the day of judgment the people who affirm 
the people who affirm with heartfelt conviction that there was no one worthy of worship but Allah will receive the benefits of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's intercession. So this is the importance of the faith in the oneness of Allah. Now, talking about this monotheism, Tawheed, the faith or belief in oneness of Allah, I would want to make it clear that it has three aspects. The three aspects, aspects being oneness in the being of Allah, oneness in the worships of Allah, and third is oneness in the attributes of Allah. Now I'll be talking about all three of these one after the other. The first is oneness in the being of Allah. This is what Allah clearly announces in Surah Al-Ikhlas. The four verses of Surah Al-Ikhlas, Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ قُفُوًا أَحَدٌ Say, He is Allah one and only one. Allah the eternal absolute. He begets not nor is he begotten and there is none like unto him. This is actually the belief in oneness of being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qul huwa Allahu ahad is actually the oneness in being. What does it actually mean? That there, there has to be no partners to Allah. The basic concept of this monotheism in being is that the person would believe that Allah has no partners, no wives, no helpers. He doesn't have a spouse, a wife, no offsprings, sons or daughters. So when somebody starts associating the creations of Allah or the creator with him, like worshipping the moon, the sun and the stars, like the people during the prophethood of Asad Ibrahim salam, they had a huge Nanar god, the god of the moon. They had a huge Shamas god, the god of the sun, the sun god. And they used to worship the stars. Then people worshipping idols made of wood or idols made of Idols made of stone, like the people of Mecca, they had they had 360 idols placed in Haina Kaaba. So this was what? Then worshipping trees, worshipping fire, the fire worshippers like the people in Persia. So this is all associating the creations of Allah with his, with the creator. And then the belief of certain followers of the prophets, like the Jews, are the Christians that their prophets were the sons of Allah or they were a part of Allah. As Allah mentions in Surah Tawbah, verse number 30, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ وَزَيْرِ بْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّسَارُ وَقَالَتِ النَّسَارُ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ قَوْلُهُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ The Jews say that Uzair is a son of Allah. And the Christians say that Christ is the son of Allah. This is a saying which just they are saying. And they, they imitate what the unbelievers of the old period used to do. And Allah curse, Allah's curse be on them. How they are deluded away from the truth. So the concept of the Christian community in saying Isa ibn Allah, that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, na'uzu billah summa na'uzu billah min zalik, was the son of Allah or the concept of Trinity, concept of three gods. And the Jews saying Uzair ibn Allah, that Hazrat Uzair radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the son of God. Or like the Makkans, they used to believe that the angels are the daughters of Allah. As Allah says in the verse 100 of Surah Al-Anam, Allah says, وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَقَاءَ الْجِنِّ وَخَلَكَهُمْ وَخَرَكُوا لَهُ بَنِينَ وَبَنَاتٍ بِغَيْرِ إِلْمٍ 
subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yatifun. They make the jinns equal with Allah. And though Allah has created the jinns, and they falsely have no knowledge, attribute to him sons and daughters, praise and glory be to him, for he is above what they attribute to him. Then making humans or making the creations of Allah as a part of Allah. Allah says in Surah Az-Zuhra, verse number 15, They attribute to some of his servants as a share with him. Truly is man clearly unthankful. So I repeat now, if I sum up what is the faith in oneness of Allah is to think never, never, ever to associate the creations with Allah. Creations being associated with Allah will be polytheism. And then thinking that the angels are the daughters of Allah will be polytheism. And then thinking that the prophets are the sons of Allah or a part of Allah will be polytheism in the in being with Allah. <coughs> the second the second aspect of oneness of Allah is oneness in worships of Allah. How can we understand this? That when a person embraces Islam and says, La ilaha illallah, then this is actually a pledge of the bondsman. This is actually the covenant to stick on the faith of oneness of Allah. Then when we, when we say, while narrating Surah Al-Fatiha in our Salah or otherwise, when we say, This is also a pledge which announces that we will worship no one other than Allah. Allah makes us announce and highlight this concept as Allah says in Surah An'am, verse number 162 and 163, la sharika lahu wa bidhalika umirtu wa ana awwalul muslimin. Qul say, Announce, tell that all my salah, my sacrifice, my life and death is for the sustainer of the worlds. He has no partners. I am commanded to be the first to submit to his orders. So this is the worship, oneness in worship of Allah. And this is exactly what we have been taught to say when we say in we sit in the tashahud of our salah and we say, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tawayyibat. All my, all my verbal, my physical or my monetary, all my oral, my bodily or my fiscal worships are for Allah. So now, the concept of iya kana budu is basically in two forms. It actually relates to two forms and states of mind. Number one, that by saying this and by believing and having faith in the oneness of Allah as worship, we mean what? That we will worship Allah and only Allah. Number one. Number two, we will worship only for Allah. We will worship, number one, we will worship only Allah and only Allah. And number two, we will worship only for Allah. Worships can be physical worships like Salah, offering Salah, fasting, remembrance or Zikr, recitation of Quran, migration or Hijrat, Jihad, and then performing Hajj has a component of physical worship as well. And then worships are monetary worships, like paying the zakat and paying charity in the way of Allah, and then then spending for jihad. And again, I repeat, Hajj has a monetary as well as a physical component of worship. And then spiritual worships, 
like the fear of Allah, piety, taqwa, then remembrance, remembrance of Allah or zikr, gratitude to Allah, that is shukr, and then dependence on Allah, reliance and dependence or trust on Allah, that is tawakkul. These are all spiritual worships. Now, all these forms of worships will only be for Allah and of Allah. That is exactly what Allah orders in Surah Fusilat, verse number 37, where Allah says, La tasjudu li shamsi wal al qamar wa tasjudu lillahi lazi khalaka hunna in kuntum miyahu ta'budun. Do not prostrate to the sun or to the moon but prostrate to Allah who has created them. And if it is him you wish to serve. So worshipping for Allah, the Salah will be for Allah. As Allah says in Surah Hajj, verse number 77, O oh, believers, you bow down, you prostrate, and you worship your sustainer, and you do good deeds so that you may be their successors. So all the salah, all the fasting, all the performing of hajj and spending of zakat and spending of all forms of charity will be in the path of Allah and for Allah. Dedication, ablation, bowing, offering sacrifices should be all for Allah. Supplication, lahu da'watul haq. Supplication, seeking protection, a'udhu billah. Repentance, rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. Trust, reliance, hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu. Hasbun Allah, ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal wakil. This is all the oneness of of the worships of Allah. And then in the oneness of worship, after all these forms of worship, the obedience of Allah. Obedience will only be of Allah. Submission, surrendering will be for Allah. What does that mean? What does that exactly means is that we realize and we announce that if the desires of our soul, the desires of our soul, the orders of the wishes of our family, our spouse, our children, the traditions or the customs of our society and of our community or the laws the regulations of our country, they, they, are, they abide by the orders of Quran and Hadith. They abide by the orders of or the commandments of Quran and Sunnah. Then we will abide by them. We will obey them. We will accept them. But if in any form, all of the explained above which I've explained, they clash, they negate, they oppose, or they are contrary to the orders of or the commandments of Quran or Sunnah or Hadith, then we will not abide, obey or accept them. This is the worship or the obedience of Allah only. As Allah says in Surah Furqan, verse number 43, Have you ever seen a person? Have you ever seen a person who has taken as his own desires? He has taken his own desires as his God, as his Allah. What does that mean? That means that we are supposed to obey Allah but when what our heart starts desiring for, we start obeying that and leave the commandments and the orders of Allah. This is making our souls, this is making our, our own self as what? Our desires as an Allah. 
And then the second thing of oneness of worship is that the worships, all the worships would only be for Allah. They will be only for Allah. The purpose of any of the physical or the monetary or the spiritual worships would not, would not be in any form other to please Allah, to save ourselves from his punishment, to save ourselves from his hellfire, to save ourselves from his wrath. The purpose of all our bodily or our verbal worships will we neither be to please or to impress people around us, nor would it be to gain the worldly repetitions, the fame, the popularity, or the worldly successes or gains. The purpose would be just to seek Allah's pleasure. No worldly gains or interests whatsoever. Prophet ﷺ was heard asking and telling the companions that shouldn't I inform you of an evil deed which is even more immense and gross and intense than the faction of the Jal or the Antichrist? They said, please do so. The Prophet ﷺ said, concealed polytheism. And then he was asked that what does it mean? Prophet ﷺ said that if a person stands up and starts praying and he notices that somebody is looking at him and then in this condition he just prolongs his salah like prolonging the the raku the prolonging the prostration of the sajda or the qiyam just because he wants to impress the person this is concealed polytheism this salah will not be for a light will be for impressing the person The third form of the faith is, the third aspect of the faith in oneness of Allah is the oneness in the attributes of Allah. The attributes of Allah are so countless and there are so many that it is just not possible to enumerate them or even to imagine them as Allah declares in Surah Al-Kahf verse number 109 قُلْ قُلْ لَوْ قَانَ الْبَحْرُ مَدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَنَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَنْفَدَ قَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَ بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَادًا Say that if the oceans were ink to write the words of my Lord Sooner would the oceans be exhausted than the words of my Allah. Even, even if similar another ocean was added for the purpose. So this is how we can understand that the countless attributes of Allah are countless and innumerable. So anybody associating the attributes of Allah to someone else is then committing polytheism in the attributes of Allah. And it will be a major revealed polytheism. Like one of the attributes of Allah is that he is Rabbul Alameen, the sustainer of the worlds. He is the provider, Razik. Razak. He knows the future. Alimul Ghayb, Alamul Ghayub. He is the creator. Khalik, Khalak, Ahsanul Khalikin. He is the helper. So now you see if any person, rather than praying to Allah, and rather than if the person is needing any forms of sustenance or any form of provisions, then Rather than asking for the Razak, Allah is Razik, Allah is Razak, and He has the keys for the provision. Allah says, Yarzuku man yashau bi ghayri hisab. But knowing everything like this, a person still 
supplicates or calls to anybody other than Allah, may it be a saint, may it be a prophet, then this will be polytheism. Like here in the subcontinent, for people in the subcontinent, they they start asking Sayyid Ali Hijwari, Rahmatullah Alay, as Ya Data, O Provider, Ya Ganjabash, O Provider of the Triers. So this is polytheism. Allah knows the future. He is Alimul Ghaib, Allah Mul Ghayub. But if any person, I'll be talking about the whole uh, concept of future predictions in the lecture after the whole topic of polytheism, inshallah. If somebody goes to a paramist or to an astrologist to find about the future, this again will be what? This will be polytheism. And this will be major revealed polytheism. Allah is the helper. But like in subcontinent, people start causing some saint as Ghosse Azam, Ghosse Thakalain, the greatest helper. This is negation of the concept of monotheism in the attributes of Allah. And this is an unpardonable sin. This is an unpardonable sin. So we nearly have talked about the main concepts. Now, I would want all of us to understand the different types of polytheism. Polytheism can be major or minor. It can be concealed or it can be revealed. Then it can be in the being, in the worships or in the attributes of Allah. Polytheism and monotheism are two conditions which are totally opposite. They're antagonistic and they can both never coexist. If a person is indulging in polytheism, then he is obviously and very obviously negating the concepts of monotheism or the belief and faith in oneness of Allah. And a person who has a strong heartfelt conviction of faith and belief in the oneness of Allah will obviously be negating and refraining from polytheism. Allah, help us all protect and elevate our faith and belief. Allah, Allah, protect, protect the faith the belief of our families, of our descendants. Allah, we all pray to you. May death be attended to all of us when we are in a state of faith. We, we are in a state of perfection of belief. We are in a state of obedience. May death be attended to us when we are in a condition of remembrance, of gratitude. When we are, we are performing salah, when we are in a position of prostration, Allah may be, may we be the lucky ones to be uttering la ilaha illallah at the time of death. Allah may we be the lucky ones to, to spend our lives till death, to strive, to struggle till our last breath, to spend our lives according to the concept of La ilaha illallah. Allah save us all from polytheism and help us all be steadfast on all forms and aspects of monotheism. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم واتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم بنا لا تزي قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك 